Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here tonight with Kurt Levins. Welcome, Kurt. Hey, Dave. Pinch hitting for our friend Bruce tonight. Great to see you. Great to see you, Kurt. Yeah, Bruce is, I think he has some kind of astronomical powwow. I'm not exactly sure what it was. I liked his Twitter explanation. He's a healthy scratch tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's getting some, uh, he's getting ready for the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> Load management. That's what he said. Yeah. Load management. <laughs> hey, there is a lot of games. This is, it's a busy time and a, frankly, a lot of somewhat meaningless games, but um, here, here we go. Game uh, 80 of the season. The Oilers win nine to two over the San Jose Sharks. Kurt, a little payback for all those years that the San Jose Sharks stomped, absolutely stomped the Edmonton Oilers. So Yeah, I felt a bit bad for the Sharks. That's a bad team. It's not much better. Like, I, I know we, sometimes we say almost in jest is like an AHL team, but <laughs> that really is like an, that about about 80 percent of those players arguably could be playing in the AHL without anyone batting an eye. There's hardly any real NHL players on that team is the truth. Well, you know, if 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 all those San Jose Sharks were trying to make this Edmonton Oilers roster, I'm I think only one would be a lock to make it, and that would be Eklund. I don't even know if he would make it because would he, how like would he three C? You know, do they? I guess he could be on the wing, right? They could be on the wing, and yeah, he would make it. I I think that that Zetterlund actually is not a bad player. Fabian Zetterlund, um, a kind of a stocky winger, like he could be a third line winger on the Oilers. Um, I don't see any of the defensemen, maybe not even Vlasic at this point in his career. I agree. He's stuck there because of his big contract and there's no moving him. So Clem Costin was the only Sharks player who wasn't a minus tonight. How did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> Some strategic line changes, I think. <laughs> I didn't even know he wasn't San Jose until tonight. I missed that trade. So, <laughs> yeah, Detroit. Uh, yeah, they're not. Um, they're not missing him. He made a mistake leaving Edmonton, but anyway, he went for the money. You can't blame. That's a lot of money that he he got an extra million dollars, or that's a lot of money for a guy who hasn't made a lot of money yet. So, yeah, yeah. Kurt, this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast with one conundrum. What is your good thing? Well, my good thing is Dylan Holloway. Um, ever since he, well, let's let's back up a little bit. Uh, his last AHL game before he was recalled was the hat trick game. So up comes the hat trick kid, which I think you might have coined <laughs> in in one of your columns in a headline, yeah, yeah, at the at the recall. And the kid has been nothing but fabulous since three point night tonight, a goal and two assists, and that line between him, Ryan McLeod, and Corey Perry is a handful and a half. Uh, no opposition seems to be able to catch McLeod and Holloway. And Corey Perry, who probably skates at half their speed when he's going full out, but he's so smart. I mean, I lost count of how, how many good plays he made down deep and along the wall tonight. He's He's just so great at protecting the puck, and he's so smart, and he, he just understands where everybody is in the zone. Uh, that trio is dangerous. Um, I think everybody saw Dylan Holloway coming up and thought, well, this is a good way to give a few people some rest and, you know, insert Holloway into the top nine, and, you know, and, and then he can be in the taxi squad for the playoffs. But as you watch him pile up points and you watch that performance on the third line, Dave, it's going to be hard to pull him out of the lineup when it comes to game one of the playoffs. In fact, if you base it on his body of work to date, since the recall, I think you'd have to play him in game one. It's going to be a tough decision. Those tough decisions are good to have if you're Chris Knobloch. Um, but it's going to be fascinating to watch because I think the kid isn't just happy to be here. I think he came here intent on pushing his way into a lineup spot. Kurt, I, I'm going to agree and disagree with you. I think he has played well, very well since the call-up. You know, tonight's game was a game against essentially a, a semi-AHL team. And that line was fantastic. The the um, 
the rush goals that the Oilers scored tonight, one after another in the second period, it was just fa- it was fantastic. And um, Holloway made some excellent passes and some smart decisions. Um, he has been a culprit on a few goals against, and I and I he, I don't know who he takes out on the fourth line because they all kill penalties, and I don't know. So Evander Kane was sitting out. Evander Kane will be in the lineup in the playoffs in the first game. So I don't know who Holloway takes out in the top nine. So I, I'm not going to agree with you. I don't think he will be in the lineup. I don't, unless unless they want him on the fourth line, somehow get him on the fourth line. I don't see it. I just don't, uh, you know, yeah. and, and he has been good, but he isn't, he isn't well, nearly as sound defensively as, as Jan Mark or, or Connor Brown or Derek Ryan or, any or Carrick. So yeah, I'm not, just to be clear, yeah. I'm not saying he absolutely should be. What okay. I'm saying is he, he's, he's making a case. He's making it tough. Like some Knobloch is going to have to look him in the eye and say, you're not playing. And the player's going to go, really? <laughs> and I think that's a, that's a good thing for the team, right? He's making, here's what he's doing, Kurt. He's making it easy. If the Oilers lose a game in the playoffs to say, to make a hard decision then. Because you might have to sit a veteran player. Let's say let's say there's someone in the top nine. It, let's say it's Evander Kane or Adam Henrique or Warren Fogle or Ryan McLeod, who's just had a bad game and hasn't isn't playing well. He's or someone who gets hurt. It's that it's yeah, well, it's obvious it if someone gets hurt, that then, then it's super easy. But even then, like if it's a hard decision, like sitting a veteran player, one of those top nine players, there's not an there's not obvious picks to sit. And Corey Perry is not an obvious pick to sit. Um, he would actually be my most likely player to sit, Corey Perry, because he I don't think he's actually in the last little while has been playing that well. This is his first really good game in a while, and he was really good tonight. But Corey Perry, to me, has not he's been looking slow and hasn't been making great plays and hasn't been super. So I just don't think you'll ever take Corey Perry out of the lineup <laughs> in the playoffs. Well, maybe not. Um, but you might bump him down to the fourth line. But then again, you know, if if you can cover yourself on the penalty kill, if you sit Brown or Yanmark, um, maybe Holloway gets in. But anyway, I think it's he's a great made it easy. He's made it much easier for Knobloch to eventually put him in, and I think we will see him in the playoffs. He's going to get a chance. There will be injuries. He is going to get a chance, and maybe he's going to make a big mark in the playoffs. I mean, everyone has seen this guy's talent, his skill, size, his hitting. And it's great to see him putting it together in a stretch of games. This is really the first stretch of games where he's put it together, and it's a sh- it's a short stretch, but you know he's gonna keep, he's gonna play the rest of the um, rest of the uh, uh, end of the season. Let's let's just jump ahead. Let's just deal with this now, Kurt. Who who do you think is gonna get called up, and who what do you think will be the policy for playing and sitting uh, players in the next couple games? Well, I I, I I'm I am. 100% positive that Philip Broberg will get called up. Yeah. And I think he and Troy Stetcher probably played both of the last remaining two games. Yeah. Uh, and if I'm Chris Knobloch, I would I would sit two entire pairs. I wouldn't mix and match anybody. You've got your pairs set. So yeah. if you decide that you're going to sit Bouchard and, and Ekholm, um, put Broberg and Stetcher in their place. Or if you decide you're going to sit, you know, Kulak and Deharney, De fine. I'd put Stetcher and Broberg in there. That's how I'd approach it. Um, up front, uh, I think there's a good chance, uh, not 100%, that Raphael Lavoie uh, will get a game or two. Yeah. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced Sam Gagne will be on the Black Aces. Whether he'll play or one or two of the final games of the season, I don't know. I think it's more likely one of the young kids will get one of those games because they already know what... what what Gagne can do, they don't need to see anything, uh, but I think he'll be he'll be around on the black aces come playoff time. I, I I if it's me, I'm I'd be happy to see McDavid and Drysaddle sit out the last two games. You know, they're 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 interesting games because you're going into to Arizona and it's the last game there. It's an emotional game, and you might get a fairly aggressive performance out of Arizona. Mm-hmm. Why be in that game? It's a nothing. It's an absolutely nothing game. Why would you risk? Um, McDavid or Drysaddle in a game like that, or Hyman. I, I'd sit all three of those players. And you're, then you're going into Colorado. And you may recall the last time the Oilers played Colorado, um, Miko Rantanen 
took a massive hit. And from Ekholm, I'd said Ekholm that game. And uh, for instance, Bouchard and Ekholm. And um, I'm not sure I'd play McDavid or Dreisaitl against that team either. Because if Manson's playing, like they might be a little bit of head hunting and looking for some revenge. You just never know. So I don't see any reason to play your best players for the rest of the season. And although I do expect that they will play, I'd be happy if they didn't. And, um, you know, bring up, bring up, um, as you say, Lavoie, bring up Sam Gagne, definitely Philip Broberg. I mean, he is overripe for sure. Yep. He's just killing it down there. And yeah, you sit at home and Bouchard one game, sit Nurse and Cece the next. Uh, or if there's some injury we don't know about, then, you know, you, you cover off those players as well. But I'm hoping that they actually really take advantage of the, the Bakersfield airlift and um, aggressively manage the load of their best players. So here's a, here's a twist on that, because I, I think all of what you just said makes perfect sense. Um, but if Vancouver loses its next game, as you know, there is still a real chance that Edmonton could catch Vancouver uh, and and win the division. Who has the tiebreaker? Is, just wait a second here. Let me just check the standings, Kurt. I, I, yeah, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, if, if, if we run the table and the Canucks don't get a single point, we can still finish first. Okay. So they just have one game left if they lose it? Do they just have one left? Or do they have two? I think both teams both teams are at the 80-game mark now. Oh, so they'd have to lose two. They'd have to lose two. And the okay. owners would have to win two. They're three back right now. All right. So it's it's possible, but I just think it's a long shot anyway. So I don't I, know who the Canucks play, I but I agree with you. I certainly agree with you that that McDavid and and Dry Settle at the absolute maximum should only play one of the two remaining games. Um. So here's the other twist. The first twist was, well, what if Vancouver loses? Here's the other twist. I think a lot of those players, it's pretty tough for you to look at look them in the eye and say you're not playing. Like tell Leon Dry Settle he's not going to play all 82 regular season games. Or Nurse or Bouchard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think the, the thing about you, you know this, David, about, about about hockey players, particularly at that level, they're incredibly competitive. They don't want a night off. You know, I think McDavid was able to, um, you know, square it in his head because he did have a minor injury that he wanted to deal with. And I think that's how he was able to get his head around it. But you saw him come back against a last place team tonight and play. Don't tell me it, it, it was any other reason than he said, okay, I'm good. Now I'm playing again. So well, he wants 100 assists, Kurt. What's that? He wanted 100 assists. Like, Well, sure. And, and who wouldn't, right? <laughs> Which is yeah. my good thing, by the way. Let's let's move on to my good thing here. Yeah, um, you bet. Or just wait, finish your point. Because you, I'm not sure you were finished your point. Um, it, it's, it's hard to tell what the mix is going to be. I think, um, your words make sense, uh, yeah. but I can think of lots of real firm arguments against not doing what you say. It'll be interesting to see what Chris Knobloch chooses. It, it will be. And it's, and I agree the players will have a say, like if, if like there, there are all those players who have played every game and that's significant for a player. Like I played every game that year. Yeah. On the other hand. They have been through this before. They have got, this is the year to win the Stanley Cup. You know, it's, it's, the clock is ticking on this team. They're all in their prime still. How would you feel if you forced your way into a game 81 against Phoenix and you got injured? Like, yeah. it's just, you had a chance to sit and rest to do the same thing. I, I just think the same thing makes so much sense that it overrides other considerations and will for the, will for the players as well. And I think we've already seen it with McDavid. And um, I'm hoping we'll see it again with McDavid. I, I, what I expect to happen is them to play one out of two games, um, not both. And uh, probably sit, makes most sense to sit against the, the Avs the last game uh, because it's closest to the playoffs. But why would you play on Thursday? Like, I, I'm not even sure they could play Saturday in theory. That's not even set yet, is it? Like, it's either Saturday or Sunday. It's sounding like Sunday, but I agree. It's not set yet. Uh, and the other thing is the goaltending. Do you play Pickard in the last two games? Maybe. Well, that's, yeah. My good thing, Kurt. Connor McDavid uh, joins the truest of hockey royalty. It's hard to think of a truer hockey royalty, except for one additional name, Gordie Howe, than Mario Lemieux, Bobby Orr, and Wayne Gretzky. 
in the 100 assist club that is an exclusive club now of course it it um with anything with any record where it's like um uh, uh, cumulative goals or cumulative assists in a season it it eliminates all the players almost from post pre expansion nhl pre initial expansion of 1967 they just played played 60 games in a season then and when you're playing 60 games it's that much mcdavid didn't get 100 assists in 60 games for instance i don't know if anybody has probably gretzky did it um but he he's probably the only one so all of these players like howie morans the, the voted the greatest player of the first half of the uh 20th century and he's in the cult of hockey logo um with wayne gretzky um and paul henderson um gretzky they just they didn't have that opportunity gordy howe didn't have an opportunity to get 100 assists so that needs to be said in terms of this record, like it's missing a couple of players who might have made it um, in their era if they played 82 games in that era. But um, nonetheless, what a tremendous accomplishment and what a great moment for Conor McDavid and you, and the whole building. You and at, at home, you and I at home, everybody said, "How could he not get an assist in a game where they're going to score, you know, nine or ten or eleven goals? How could that happen?" <laughs> and then it happened, and it was a, it was a very nice play too. He gets a, a fantastic stretch pass from Darnell Nurse, who had held the puck, waited for the seam to open up, and made the great pass up ice. And he charges in. He deeks a player who who's uh, you know sprawling to the ice, and feeds Hyman for the goal. It was a it was a kind of a classic goal for this season, and a great moment. And to see him smile on the bench, uh, his his great smile, it, it meant a lot to him. It was nice to see that it did. And, and he acknowledged that in between periods in the interview with uh, Gene Principe talking about being in that select group. I mean, just imagine if your name was in that group of players with um, with Orr and Lemieux and Gretzky. What a thing to do. What an accomplishment. Well, um, my favorite hockey player of all time uh, is Bobby Orr. Uh, and here's where I'm going to shake the picture up just a little bit. And... <laughs> I can see it now, Kurt. Oh, it's it's out of focus again. It's uh, anyway. It was in focus for a second. <laughs> That's our high tech cult of hockey uh, graphics. Yes. There you go. Autographed in person by Bobby Orr and Oh, Hayden. sweet. Yeah. So, Kurt, I have yes. a Bobby Orr story that I'm going to tell you. Okay. Just it's the my so I was a student at Carleton University. And we were uh, partnered with the Reader's Digest on a project where they were teaching us to do investigative reporting. And we were looking at uh, major junior players and whether the at that time major junior was a good deal for players. This was before the university scholarship program was brought brought in. So we were calling people up and asking them. And I had the task of interviewing Bobby Orr on this. So I'm here in Edmonton, Alberta, and I call and I call I call him one night and I forgot about the time zone difference. So I called him. It must have been, it, I think it was about midnight, his time. And I woke him up. I woke up Bobby Orr. <laughs> I'm like this 20-year-old kid who's hardly interviewed anybody. And I'm interviewing Bobby Orr. And he was the most polite person and gentleman. And he gave me a full interview. That's Bobby yeah. Orr. Yeah, that, that is my experience. Every every I've interacted with Mr. Orr a few times. And he has been the same with me every time as well the first time i ever met him was the very first or cherry uh game yeah uh, everyone they used to play the prospect games and yeah. or cherry coaches i covered the very first one and i remember and i'm not a nervous person but i was nervous before i went down to the dressing room after the game because bobby Orr was my idol and you know what they say don't meet your idols right and I was scared stiff that, that Bob Yor might not be everything that I thought he was. And I was so relieved after the fact to realize that he was everything that I thought he was and more. So it's, I had a very similar experience with Mr. Orr that you did. That's, that, your story is pretty cool. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of embarrassing, but uh, I think he said, do you, know what, do you know what time it is? I said, no. <laughs> well, you know, no, I don't. He had to put up with Derek Sanderson all those years, David. This was probably minor compared to that. <laughs> uh, and he was very thoughtful in the interview. I gave an interesting critique of, of Major Junior. All right, Kurt. Um, 
let's move on to our bad things. They're, they're, they're fairly small. What is your bad thing tonight? Yeah, it's uh, it's tough in a 9-2 game to, to pick a bad thing. But I'll I'll pick the Vincent DeHarnay, uh play on the 9-2 goal. Um, it's a 9-1 game. Um, and you, as the most defensive of defensive defensemen on this team, decide this is a good time to press up in the play and, and get caught up in what turned into a two-on-one, and despite the very best efforts of Ryan Nugent Hopkins, who busted his hump to get back and actually got his man, uh, but ultimately uh, Anaheim, um, uh, sorry, San Jose scored the 9-2 goal on the play. There's a case where, look, Vincent DeArnier is a valuable member of this team, and I don't mean to hack on him, but but once you've been in this league for a little, little, little while, you have to understand the situation in the game what's going on and decide that that puck just needs to be lifted into the corner and you need to get off the ice. And <laughs> right. You know, so I'm not going to yard on the guy. It was, it was a minor mistake at a nothing point and a runaway laugh, but come playoff time. I sure hope he makes a better decision than that. <laughs> oh, I think he will. I think it was for him. It's more like the exception to the rules. Like the only time I'm ever going to rush the puck is in a nine, nine to one game with five with four minutes left, and then I'll, then I will rush it. That's the exception to his rule. He he hasn't been caught up ice very much all year long. So, uh, but he definitely was in that moment. And then he made another rush shortly after that, where he went in pretty deep. And I think he went on the four check too. So. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Maybe he wanted to be even like Clint Costin and not plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Costin, the only even player of that game. Amazing. Um, Bruce, my bad thing is, well, I'm not going to say this is troubling, but just a wee bit. Stuart Skinner has, I, I think, not been super sharp for a while now. And um, the first goal that he let in, Although it was already, I think, four nothing at that point, um, it was a weird goal to let in. It wasn't. It wasn't any kind of hard shot. I mean, it's like if it was in a key moment in a key game, it would have been a horrendous goal against obvious. And anyway, because it was just a bad angle shot um, that right on, right near the. You know, there was nowhere to shoot, nowhere to score, and the only way it got in because his stick was too high and his foot wasn't against the post. It was two mistakes in a row, and I, and again. Um, not to make too much of it, but he hasn't been super sharp. I thought he let in a weak goal against last game, um, the the one on the rush that was generally blamed on Nurse. Um, and Holloway, I thought actually Stu should have had that as well. Shot from the dot like that NHL goalies have 90% of the time, 95, you know, 90% of the time. Um, so that is, you know, not great. And, 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 and he, it will unsettle him a little bit. And just maybe the team, just a little bit. It's one of those weird, weird little things. It's like in the back of your mind now. Okay, well, Stu's not really, he's not kicking butt right now. Would It, it would be nice if he was. So I, I think we actually, I think he will get another game probably just to see if he can uh, get through a game without any bad goals at all. I agree it was a bit of a Miko Koskinen goal. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> I kind of was having flashbacks and cold sweats when I saw that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I did feel good about the breakaway save that he made a while later. And, yes. And I thought he snapped that puck rather emphatically as if to say, all right, now I'm locked in. Um, Fair enough. I, I guess you can do the old Grant Fear thing. It's, it's, it's not how many you let in, it's what you stop and when. But I'm, I'm with you. When I saw that goal, I went, oof. Yeah. The eyes stung a little bit on that one. There was a great thing online the other day on Twitter. Uh, Paul Campbell, who's a uh, just a fan in Toronto and a, and a goal, and, you know, like a, uh, I'm not sure what level of goalie plays beer league goalie, whatever, but he's a goalie from way back. And and he he was he uh, found this uh, some other goalie talking about his mindset and about how the goal his whole mindset is like there is not there is there's no score, there's nothing, there's no future, there's no past, there's just this moment, and I'm just here. That's it. And I don't care about anything else and, and nothing, nothing matters. They're just this moment, whatever happens, happens. Just this kind of um, being totally present in the moment and not worried about anything, 
just just kind of being there and doing your thing, having a blank slate, so to speak, and letting your training take over. So the performance anxiety doesn't destroy you in the moment. And um, it was just, an, you can look it up on Twitter uh, if you Google Paul Campbell. And um, it was a great quote. And I think that all these goalies are incredibly mentally strong in that way. So Stu Skinner's probably, this probably isn't phasing him at all. But I just remember from reading the game, Ken Dryden's great book, about um, how everything, how he took it, everything he did on the ice, he wanted it to be in sync. Early in the game, if he was handling the puck, he wanted to make a good pass with the puck. So, so the whole team's rhythm and confidence would build. So there'd be nothing to throw it off. And he saw on that great team, that's how he saw his role was just not to to be to be uh, a cog in the machine and not be out of place because if he was that, that team would usually win. And on a certain level, I mean, these, these orders aren't as dominant as that Canadians team, although they're not that far off in my opinion. Um, um, Skinner has to be the same thing. Just don't let anything unsettle anybody else. And he might have that in mind. I'm not sure, but that's what I was thinking of that, you know, the, the Ken Dryden uh, example. Kurt, um, your number. 80, 8 zero, uh, which is the point total that Evan Bouchard achieved during tonight's game. Um, miles and miles and paragraphs and paragraphs and pages and pages have been written about Evan Bouchard's game. Um, but at the end of the day, the hardest thing to do in hockey is score. Uh, and... Evan Bouchard is now only the second defenseman in Edmonton Oilers history to reach the 80 point mark in a season. And of course, the other guy stands behind him on the bench. That's Paul Coffey. Um, is Evan Bouchard the perfect defender? Absolutely not. Uh, but I think we don't do this enough. And the next breath was Paul Coffey the perfect defender? Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> Right. And, yeah. You know, am, am I saying Evan Bouchard is Paul Coffey? Well, not yet. Um, but when when you score 80 points from 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 the rear, you're doing something right. Um, and and many people have been critical of Evan Bouchard's uneven defensive game. Me included. I don't mean to, you know, throw rocks at glass houses. Um, but um it's a real accomplishment for the young man. He's come a long way. Um, and you get the feeling that he's not tapped out. Uh, I think this kid is getting better and better. Um, but the funny thing about the 80th point tonight, it comes after three or four games where I've watched Evan Bouchard and I've thought to myself, he's defending way better than he has all year long. And you might remember that defensively, Bouchard was actually pretty decent in the playoffs last year, too. Um, no one expects him to be Matthias Eckholm. Um, but if he can, he's a big, tall guy. You know, when he can use his reach and use his height and take his man, that simple defensive game behind his own blue line will lead to more and more chances with the puck headed in the other direction. So I think... 80 points is a nice uh, benchmark for him to hit. But I think behind the scenes, it's his gradually improving defensive play that's allowing him to achieve these things. Yeah, there's been um, comparisons for a long time of Bouchard to Larry Murphy, who was a highly skilled defenseman who had um, his defensive mistakes. Um, but the player that I think is, and I think that's not a bad comparison. I mean, Larry Murphy's in the Hall of Fame, if I'm not mistaken. As a Stanley Cup ring, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm, but the, the defenseman I think that I think he reminds me of is Al McInnes. And if he can start to reach that level of play all around, I think McInnes was a better defensive defenseman. But his offensive game, Bouchard's offensive game is very similar to McInnes. And the, McInnes had that great shot. Bouchard has the great shot. McInnes was a fantastic passer of the puck. So is Evan Bouchard. Um, Murphy didn't have the shot that 
uh, those two players. He had a decent shot, but not like McInnes or Bouchard. So, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it all plays out. I agree. There's still miles to go for Evan Bouchard, especially in the playoffs, right? Like, let's see how all these guys do in the in the playoffs. That's what I'm really curious to see, and um, see where um, he ends up. Uh, the McInnes comparison is interesting. I I was on the host broadcast when McInnes played in Calgary. Uh, oh yeah, and and he's a very nice guy, by the way, very generous, very down to earth fellow. Um, I'd say there are two unique points on, on the on the players. One thing, McInnes was downright mean on the ice. Like he he had a chippiness to him that Evan does not have. Fair enough. And on the other hand, Evan is a way more fluid player than McKinnis was. Uh, Al was everything that you said he was. Great shot, good passer, you know, winner, etc. cetera. Um, but his, he had a bit of a herky-jerky style to him, whereas Evan is a, is a, is a very fluid player. Uh, and so they, they appear to be different on the ice. But I agree, they do have some, some interesting similarities as well. If Evan Bouchard ends up having even close to the career Al McKinnis have, I think all Oiler fans will be pretty happy. So, Kurt, since the turn of the century, um, in this century, only um, 11 defensemen have had 80-point seasons in the NHL. Eric Carlson leads the way at 101-point season last year. Roman Yossi, 21-22, had 96 points. Then we go down Hughes, 91, McCarr, 89, McCarr, 86, Yossi, 85, Hedman, 85, Burns, 83, Carlson, 82, and then there's Evan Bouchard, 81. So That's remarkable company that Evan Bouchard's in. Are all but two of those guys Norris Trophy winners? Hughes is yet to win the Norris. And Bouchard is yet to win the Norris. I and think Bouchard's, everybody else the list has, right? Hughes will win the Norris, it looks like, this year. I'm, yeah. Seems, seems like a pretty solid bet. So he's going to win the North. So yeah, there'll only be one guy who has it on that entire list. So that's and the and the just behind him is Lidstrom, who won the Norris a few times. Wow, who had eighty points? Making my point for me, David. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just was curious, um, Kurt. My number is there were so many goals on the rush tonight that I just got. I was I was thinking, man, um, we can remember a time when this was a huge problem this year. So in the first 13 games of the year under Jay Woodcroft, the Oilers had uh, nine goals, four on the rush at even strength and 23 against. So that's 28% uh, goals, 4% on, on the rush uh, at that point. Under Knobloch, 83, four, 63 against and a 57% uh, goals, 4 percentage. That's a huge difference um, wow. under those two coaches. And I don't think there's much difference on the attack other than they're, fin- they're getting bit better puck luck on the attack they were still getting pretty good chances defensively though the the orders were a mess at the start of the year and and in net they were a mess so those two things led to all those rush chances against and obviously they're a much better defensive team against Knobloch and it's actually their defensive play which I think is a reasonable gives gives a reasonable hope for Oilers fans that they'll win the cup this year their defensive play um has not been this consistently good since since Mac T was coach since Pronger was on defense right like he, that was a pretty good defensive team when they wanted to be this yep. is a pretty good defensive team when they want to be and um they've shut it down on the rush they've shut it down in in all situations under Knobloch so I'm pretty uh I'm really happy about that Kurt I was I just love the winning streak, not just because it was such a great winning streak, but because they played such solid defensive hockey, and we haven't seen that from the Oilers. So, yeah. so many games of allowing two goals or less, right? Yeah, yeah. And the interesting asterisk on tonight's game, of course, is that all nine goals were five on five. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Was there a power play? I can't even remember. Uh, they had one. They had one. All right. Um. All right. Our conundrum, Kurt. And it is a conundrum indeed. Who would you most like to see the orders play in the first round and least like to see the orders play? Because it could be any of them, Nashville, L.A., or Vegas, as I understand it. Yeah. 
Um, you want me to go first? Go ahead. Um, if I'm picking, I'll pick Nashville. Uh, because even though they've had a very hot second half, they've really come on. They've certainly earned their way in, into the postseason. Um, the owners have owned Nashville. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl in particular has owned the Predators. Uh, I think that's actually a, a quite a poor match for Nashville. Um, and so if I had to choose, I'd pick that. I, don't, I think that's highly unlikely that's going to happen. Uh, but that would have been my 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 my, my best case scenario. Um, I guess the toughest one is Vegas um, because they didn't beat them last year. And that question as a result is still to be answered. But what I'll say in my next breath about this question in general is good teams don't care who they play. And I think the Oilers are a really good team that shouldn't care who they play. I think they're good enough to beat anybody. I think the toughest out in the Western Conference is Dallas. I think the second toughest out is Edmonton. And as a result, I don't think they should care who they play. If I had to pick, I'd sooner not see Vegas. I'd sooner see Nashville, but I guess we'll see. I think the Oilers are the toughest out. They now have a better goal differential than Dallas by one, 64 to 63. The Oilers have the best goal differential. And even though Dallas is a fantastic team, I think the Oilers are a better team. They've just got the two superstars. Um, does Dallas have the two superstars? They've got a ton of really good players. Yeah, they're a very good and team. And the, the level of determination from McDavid and uh, Drysaddle this year, I think it's going to be off the charts good. Um, anyway, I, I I said this before, and I really I think the only team that can beat the Oilers in these playoffs are the Oilers. If they play their game, they should they should win. They should win the Stanley Cup. I really believe that, and I believe they're the best team. So, uh, and I and I really like your point that they don't they shouldn't care and they don't care. As a fan, I would love to see Vegas go and have to play Dallas. I just I just I just think that would be justice for I'm that. With you. <laughs> so I'm just hoping for that. And even though if the Oilers play Vegas, I think that's fine. Play Vegas. You know, the last, that was a good game against Vegas. They really handled them last game. That's got to be in Vegas's head a little bit. Um, but I think your point about Nashville is is really good. Like, just when you when you look at the way these teams match up, the Oilers have just dominated the Predators. They're not a veteran team. The Predators. Um, they've been hot, but um, we'll see. You know, that would be the best ideal matchup. So they have 99 points. They're done. The Kings have 97 points. Now, I don't know who who wins if they tie the Kings or the Predators. Like, who, if they're tied in the standings. But no, that, it doesn't matter. So if the Kings win their next game, they'll have 99. But Vegas could finish with 100. So, yeah, Nashville and the Kings could be tied. I don't know who wins the tiebreaker. I uh, I. I did hear someone say tonight there is a, albeit slim, possibility the Oilers could play Nashville. Let me see this, what the tiebreaker is. The team, okay, the team with the greater number of games won, excluding games won in overtime or the shootout. So uh, it looks like um, LA has 43 wins. And 11 overtime Batman points. And Nashville has 47 wins and just five. So it looks like if they're tied, um, Nashville will win that tiebreaker. So the only so the way that the you you play Nashville is if Ve LA stays ahead of Vegas, but Vegas moves ahead of LA. Oh, I, I could see Vegas could get three points and then tie Nashville, but they also have fewer wins. I don't think there's a possibility the Oilers can play Nashville. I heard someone say that. But anyway. Maybe they, I could be wrong. We'll be corrected by, um, well, Ira Cooper usually listens and he'll know. <laughs> he'll have thought through this and Bruce, I, he'll, no, Ira, Ira, Ira will know. Ira will know. <laughs> He's original Pozar on, um, on uh, Twitter. Uh, and a uh, contributor to the cult of hockey, and he he will know the answer to this question. My reading of it, and I'm probably wrong, is I don't, I'm not seeing. Anyway, I would prefer. I'm not worried about LA though either. Like personally, nope. LA, um, they're a good team. 
but I just think the Oilers. So my order of preference, if they can play Nashville, that's number one. Then L.A. and then Vegas. Yeah, L.A.'s two best players are a year older than when we beat them last time. It's the clock is really ticking on yeah. the L.A. And I Kings. I respect those players, but yeah. Well, Drew Doughty is such a fantastic hockey player. Always has been. He and Kopitar are great players. They're just not as young and quick and spry as they used to be. Yeah. And the Oilers aren't the Oilers that lost, let's say, to Chicago a few years ago when there was lots of veteran players on Chicago. Kind of, this is not that Oilers team, but. Oilers are the oldest team in the league now. <sighs> ah, yeah, indeed. Indeed. All right, Kurt. Well, you're going to finish your posting of the game grades tonight, and um, I will add in the the code uh, for the uh, this podcast. So I want to thank you for filling in for Bruce tonight. Thanks a lot, Kurt. Hey, hey I, I, I'm happy to, to do my rusty star best pinch hitting for my friend Bruce. So. <laughs> Le Grand Orange. All right. Thanks, Kurt. See you, Dave. Take care. See you, everybody. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.